Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to another episode of On the Couch with Creatives, the podcast for creative professionals everywhere. We're part of the Creatives Group, a professional private networking group of industry professionals within the creative industries to provide a safe space to connect, grow and learn from each other. I'm very, very excited today because we have a very, very, very special guest. So Julie, would you do the honours, please? Well, joining us on the couch today is Stephen Colgan, a man of many, many talents. A former police officer who landed up script writing for the popular QI TV show, winning a BAFTA. And he's written three murder mysteries. And he's with books. He's an author as well. He's also an artist and a sculptor. And an actor, because he recently starred in Millie Me and My um, film Scooch. So what do we start talking to him about, Melanie? Well... Hello, Stephen. Hello. <laughs> yes. Hello, hello, welcome. And as Julie said, there are just so many arrows to your bow. And as I've said to you probably many times before, if I didn't like you so much, I'd probably hate you, because it's quite unfair, in my view, that one person can be just so talented... And I don't think there's anything that you can't do, quite frankly. Not a bad answer. Oh, 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 oh. oh no, 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 no. He's, there's he's lots a... I can't do. There's lots <laughs> I can't do. Just, just ask, me to, ask me to put up a shelf or fix anything. <laughs> then you'll discover what I can't do. So. Oh, bless you. Um, but no, I mean, you, you are just so talented. It, it just blows me away. Every time I go onto social media and you've created something new and wonderful. But you started off in the Metropolitan Police Force and you built your career there. and led a task force for um, problem solving, the problem solving unit, I think at Scotland Yard. And to, for me, the transition from that going to being a writer, script writer for the very, very popular show QI, how did that all come about? How did you go from being a police officer to a much more creative role and end up working for the BBC? Well, I'd always been a creative individual anyway. I've always been someone who's written and drawn and sculpted and played music and, you know, anything sort of vaguely arty, I can turn my hand to. Um, and I, I was, I was sort of, I grew up in Cornwall and when I finished the sixth form, I was sort of dawdling between, I had places um, set aside to go to either catering school, catering college to be a chef or to go to art college. And I had a year to wait. Um, and during that interim period, my, my dad, my late father, who was a, a police officer in the Devon and Cornwall Police, took me out for my 18th birthday party, you know, for a drink. And we got into one of those father-son chats about, well, what are you going to do with your life, boy? You know, rah, 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 rah. And, and somehow during the course of the evening, I drunkenly accepted a bet that I could be a police officer for six months because he challenged me. He bet me £50 that I couldn't survive six months as a cop. And, and he'd even made up a little, like, contract and typed it, obviously, when he'd had a couple of beers as well, and got people to sign it and witness it as if that made it legal. Um, so I said, I'll take your bet, I'll take your 50 quid, and I'll go and do it in that London, because that's where some of my friends are going to Polytechnic. So I came up to London, and, and six months became 30 years, basically. But, um, but because I, I landed on my feet in London with, with the belief that I was only going to be there for six months, it, it allowed me to be a little bit cockier than, than some younger police officers. And the fact that if I saw things I thought weren't quite right, if, if things didn't make sense, I would say so. And I made a bit of a nuisance to myself um, querying police procedures. Why do we do it that way? I mean, the one thing that really bugged me was that all police activity seemed to be passive. It all seemed to be picking up after the event had happened, whereas... I went out and talked to members of the public and they all wanted not to be victims of crime. You know, that they, they said, it's great the cops are good at catching the bad guys, but we'd rather we weren't burgled beforehand. And I did a lot of work studying sort of prevention and preventative methods and crime science and, and human behavioral science. And that's um, ultimately the direction my career went because I, although I was swimming against the tide for most of that career, um, the creative side of me, was coming up with solutions to uh, problems that didn't respond to normal policing methods. Like, um, I suppose the, the obvious one that I often talk about is that um, there were complaints about noisy nightclubs and people wanted them shut down. Well, they, they kept throwing police officers at it and it wasn't making any difference. It was just, if anything, aggravating the crowd and increasing the noise. 
Um, I looked at it from the point of view, well, if noise is the issue, how can we keep them quiet? So we got the, um, the door staff to give people lollipops when they came out of the club because that kept them quiet because it's quite hard to <laughs> shout. When you've when you got a... It's quite hard to, it's quite hard to be loud. Um, it also had a secondary benefit I hadn't expected in the fact that it, it reduced aggression in men, maybe because it's a bit childish and a bit silly, but we didn't have so many punch ups. And um, what is it? Was, was it a dummy effect? You gave them a lot Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, and yeah, 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 I mean, if I could have given them dummies, I would have done. But but just giving people lollipops. And, and of course, it cost the public nothing because the nightclub paid for the lollipops. Well, in fact, the clubbers ultimately paid for it. So it all would have been built into the price of their entrance fee or the bar prices or whatever. But I started doing more and more things like that. And even though I was swimming against the tide and it wound up a lot of my senior officers at the time, um, about probably about two thirds of the way through my police service, I got a call to be part of a unit. I have to say, I didn't lead the problem solving unit, but I got a call to be part of this brand new team that was being put together to explore some of these ideas. And eventually it ended up working with the Home Office and getting this built into police training around the country, uh, going out and working with American police forces, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it was a way of using my natural creativity and, and ideas within policing. And it, and it gave me a, a fascinating and interesting career. But towards the end of my police career, I, I'd already started putting together a book um, which came out under the title of Joined Up Thinking, which I was never happy with, but the publishers and I, we, we sort of spent ages trying to find exactly the right title. When we found exactly the right title, we found we weren't allowed to use it for various reasons. So at the, at the 11th hour, it became Joined Up Thinking. But that was the link to QI because I did a few literary festivals and events. And um, I was at the Douglas Adams the first Douglas Adams Memorial Lecture, because I, I knew Douglas Adams, I'd met Douglas Adams a few times. And I got invited to the first uh, Memorial Lecture, which was um, hosted by Stephen Fry and people like John Lloyd, the, the guy behind QI was there. And it was Stephen who I got speaking to. And he said, I told him about the book I'd been writing, which was all about the interconnectedness of facts, interconnectedness of, of, of things. And he said, Oh, John Lloyd would probably like that sort of thing. So he he gave me his email address and he also sent it to John Lloyd. And then I got a call from John Lloyd saying, come and meet me at the QI club in Oxford. Because in those days, QI had its own little private members club in, in Oxford. Um, so I went over there and um, next thing you know, I was writing for the QI annuals and books. That progressed to working on the radio series, the Museum of Curiosity, and that progressed to working on the TV show. So it was a kind of, and, and then all of this happened just around the time I was stepping out of my policing uniform as I reached retirement. So, Oh, wow. So you had a second career just waiting there for you as you were about to Yeah, I mean, I mean, almost, almost accidentally. But then again, I'm a great believer in saying yes to things. I'm a great believer in if, if someone offers you an opportunity, take it. And, you know, I got invited to go to this lecture and I thought, well, I'm just going to be one person sitting in that big audience, you know, talking about, you know Douglas Adams and I think uh, Professor Richard Dawkins was the guest speaker that night and um, but it was in the sort of room afterwards there was a sort of book of condolence and people chatting about their memories of Douglas and, and by sheer fluke I ended up chatting to Stephen Fry and it all went from there so and, and you've got a BAFTA for one of the episodes of QI no 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 no, no. Um, QI has won quite a few BAFTAs I haven't won any myself Oh, um, so you haven't got that got it on your on your bookshelf? I'm afraid not. No, the closest oh. the closest I've got to anything like that is that the uh, the Museum of Curiosity, which is QI's sister show on Radio Four, I was on the writing team that won the Rose Door one year. So, uh, and again, the trophy's not on my shelf; it's in the QI office. And um, I was also one of the writers um, when QI won a national TV award, which again is also in the QI office. So um, I'm, I'm just a small cog in a, in a very big, complex thing that's won lots and lots of awards, but quite proud to have been a small part of it. Yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? It's lovely to have been to, to be able to say that you have been a part of that, especially, as you say, it came about quite by chance. And yeah, yeah. You know, you and I are quite similar in that respect. You know, I, I don't say no to a lot of things. And how you and I first met Stephen was at the, uh, on a community radio 
station, uh, Wickham Sound, quite, quite a few years ago now, when I um, had my own sports show. And I, I met Stephen and we got chatting and um, I invited Stephen to come along to do a show with me. Do you remember? It was hilarious. And we did it on sort of oldie worldie bizarre sports, like, you know, tossing the cheese <laughs> and, and, and oh, on cheese rolling, yeah, bashing, yeah. and um, what was the other one with the, with the the sort of big bladder thing where they sort of take it from one end of the village to the oh, other? Oh, the Haxley Hood. Each other. Yeah, Haxley Hood. That's called. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's one of Britain's many mob football games, as they call it, that, that predate the actual game of football. These are held all over the UK. I mean, yeah. bizarrely, in Borton on the Water, not too far from here, over in the Cotswolds, they still play river football once a year they actually play football in the river up to their knees in water which is so difficult these these things are going on all around the country i love yeah. it i mean yeah. i also love the fact that the olympics used to have sports that we wouldn't even consider now things like you know um they used to have swimming races for horses they used to have, they used to have pigeon shooting live pigeon shooting used to be an event in the olympics it's bizarre it's bizarre yeah. Yes, well, so let's we talk about your books now. You have three mm. murder mysteries that you set in the countryside, the English countryside. Can you tell us a bit more about all three of them? Yeah, I mean, I've I done several non-fiction books, but I've, I've always liked writing stories. And um, it got to the point where I'd had a couple of books that did okay. I mean, none of them have ever been really, you know, top sellers or anything, but they've done okay. And, and I thought, you know, it's about time I put one of these novels out. And so I... Um, the first book that came out was called A Murder to Die For. And the, the idea was very, it combines several things. I mean, the fact that I've been a police officer means that I do understand police procedure and how it works and what the real world is like, as opposed to the, the sort of very different, I can't watch cop shows. I can't watch cop shows. They're just so inaccurate all the time. It just drives me nuts. But I do quite like classic murder mystery, you know, and silly stuff like Midsummer Murders. I love that sort of thing. And I thought there's got to be a way of combining those to, to have the real world meeting the fictional world and, and that sort of clash of cultures. And I, I, it suddenly came to me one day, it'd be very funny to have, I, I tell you what inspired it, I went out to America to Comic-Con, which is like the biggest comics and film convention mm -hmm. in the world. And I overheard two guys dressed as Batman bitching or bat bitching about another guy dressed as Batman, although the ones who were having a little bit of a, a moan were dressed as Tim Burton era black man, uh, Batman, you know, with all of the rubber gear and that sort of thing. And they were they were taking the mickey out of someone who was a 1960s Adam West Batman. But what they were what they were moaning about was the fact that his tights were the wrong shade of grey. And I thought this is so funny that, that this this idea that you can have these little factions and these little fan groups. In fact, just last year I discovered that in the UK there are three organisations. Um, who are in charge of catching moles. There are three mole-catching associations in the UK, and they all hate each other. They're all at war. I just love this. It's brilliant. Um, <laughs> it's, it's all People's Front of Judea, Judea and People's Front going on. You know? And um, I just thought it would be really good fun to have a, a, fa a big convention to do with um, murder mystery and then have all these different fan clubs who all hate each other at this convention, and then one of the fans gets murdered. And I thought what would be really, really funny is if they're all fans of the same series of books, so that they've all turned up dressed as the same characters. So the idea would be that you've got the person who's got marri uh, married, the person who's got murdered, so the victim, all the witnesses, and potentially the bad person as well, the murderer themselves, are all dressed as the same character. And the idea then of, of bringing the real police force in to try and deal with this uh, murder investigation plus all the murder mystery fans think they can solve it as well and those two cultures coming to head to head it was just a joy it was just, it, it wrote itself so that, that was your first book right have you got a copy there uh yeah that was that was the first novel anyway um that's it here a murder to die for it's very and people funny. can get that on amazon yeah yeah it's still yeah. available i think i think it's still available it also came out as an audio book brilliantly read by rula Lenska, who gave it a a whole new dimension because I've always said this before. I, I, I don't know why authors read their own books as audio books because if you get an actor to come in and read it, they, they, they play the parts and they add a whole new dimension to it. Ruler made a, an absolutely brilliant job of it. it it's oh, okay. really, really funny. Um, I mean, I was listening to it thinking, 
I'd never thought about delivering the line that way. And, and, you know, it's just really good. So yeah, that was the first one. And then I followed up with a, a sequel. Well, it's kind of a sequel. All the books can be read independently, but it picks up some strands from the first book. And that's this one. That, that was, was the Diabolical really Club. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. That was the one. second one, which um, has a sort of historical murder that's got to be solved. And it all ties in with a secret society from the from the Regency period. I'm sort of loosely based on the fact that not far from here in West Wickham is, is the location of where the Hellfire Club, the real yeah. Hellfire Club existed. Uh, once upon a time where a bunch of poshos would all go into these caves dug into a hillside and have all these um, gluttonous meals and, well, probably Boys. orgies as well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the Diabolical Club builds on some of that history as well. And then the third book, um, which again, only picks up strands from the other two books, but is, is an entirely separate book, is this one, which has a slightly controversial title, um, Although the title is pronounced Corrings. <laughs> Corrings. It's pronounced Corrings because the, the joke here, the conceit is that during the Victorian era, a lot of people who had the word, anyone who had a surname that sounded vaguely rude because it was well known that Queen Victoria, in her private life, very rude lady, but in her public life, quite prudish. Um, she was quite clear that she didn't like certain words. Like She didn't like the word belly. She thought the word belly was vulgar, for example. And um, they were worried that having C-O-C-K in their name made it sound a bit vulgar. So they started pronouncing it strangely. I mean, the, the best example, I suppose, the best well-known example is there's quite a well-known brand of port, which you can buy in um, any off-license or supermarket, which is called Coburn's. But of course, on the bottle, it says Cockburn's. <laughs> and um yeah but it's pronounced coburn so they just politely that's... drop the ck right yeah yeah i mean i mean <laughs> i was the book was originally going to be called something different because i met this guy who for for ages uh, he's he, his name was trebilco and um and i i wondered how it was spelt because coming from cornwall a lot of cornish mm. surnames start with tre start with tree so i asked him one day i said trebilco is that cornish and he goes no 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 it's uh, I, I don't know where it's from mm. And then I asked him how it was spelt, and he rather embarrassingly spelled it out for me, and it was basically treble cock. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's pronounced trebilco. So I tried to think of the funniest word I could that had this idea of dropping the CK, and of course, Corrings just grew out of it. And um, that's a book about a, an aristocratic mm -hmm. brother and sister who are feuding over money and somehow getting drawn into this uh, argument is a, a geriatric circus because I was, I was quite interested in that idea as well the idea that circuses are kind of on the way out now certainly any circuses with animals they, they, they almost impossible for them to set up anywhere now most towns won't have them so it's all Cirque du Soleil now which is all quite modern lithe people you know doing doing extraordinary acrobatic acts and the old style circus is sort of limping its way to extinction and I just like the idea of having a circus with all these aged performers in their in their 70s and 80s and 90s you know have all got all terrible problems with their back and lumbago and things like this and, and trying to do their act and uh yeah i that that's the one i most enjoyed writing because yeah. i could really go silly with the, the I, I loved it i loved it i that's the one out of the three that i would love to see on screen because when i was reading it i it was hilarious and I just was every page I could just see in glorious Technicolor. Yeah. And I just thought, someone's got to do something with this because it was it's just delightful. How can you not love aged incontinent elephants and drunk clowns and, and uh, you know, people doing trapeze acts and putting their hips out and things like that? I mean, it's, it's just made for comedy. Who it, gets it murdered so then? Sorry? Who gets murdered? Well, actually, it's not so much of a murder mystery, that one. It's more of a straight... You know, in the grand tradition of British comic writing, it's just a, a comedy novel. Uh, I mean, there are some people who do get killed in it. <laughs> I must say, but it's not a it's not a murder mystery in this instance. It's um, it's just a straight comedy in, in the great tradition, you know, of, of Jerome K. Jerome and Tom Sharp and uh, Oberon War and all those other great mm -hmm. British. who I don't compare myself to, but all those great British humorists. Well, I think and, you can. <laughs> well, it's it's really tricky because we don't you don't get. British comedy novels now which is which is such a huge shame I mean part of it I think is we lost an awful lot of 
great British comedy writers around the same time. I mean, we lost Sue Townsend, you know, Adrian oh. Mole books. We lost Tom Sharp. We lost Terry Pratchett. We lost Douglas Adams. All these, uh, David Nobbs, all these great British comedy writers all seem to sort of die very close to each other. And because of that, I think the, the publishing industry's algorithms are saying, well, there's no comedy bestsellers coming out now. So it's kind of fallen off the radar yeah. because it's very hard. I mean, there isn't even a comedy section in bookshops anymore. Or, yeah. or if there is, it's just TV tie-ins. You know, it's just mm-hmm. stuff, you know, the, the week annual and things like that. Yeah. And I think it's a shame. There's this massive tradition going right back to, you know, Diary of a Nobody and Three Men in a Boat and yeah. going through PG Woodhouse and all these sorts of people. And the British are very good at comedy writing. They oh. are. But, you know, just, just two or three years ago, the, the Everyman Bollinger Woodhouse Prize, which is offered for the best comic novel of the year, wasn't awarded for the first time in its history because they couldn't find a funny enough book. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy because we, we've kind of lost that continuity. With so so did, did you actually enter into the competition? Well, I don't know. Because you, you're not allowed to enter these competitions yourself. It's your publisher who decides to enter or not. And of course, uh, they never tell you. They uh, never tell you if they've entered you because otherwise every other writer in their stable might say, well, why didn't you enter me? Mm, you know, so mm. um, I don't know. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to say no, because then I don't have to deal with the mm. idea that it didn't win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but building building on that, I mean, you're you're a man who, as I say, can, can turn your hand to, to most things. I mean, not only have you written these wonderful books and written uh, the scripts for QI, I mean, you did a lot of the artwork for QI as, as well, um, for the yeah. annuals and, and, and things like that. And um, throughout lockdown, you know, lockdown was, was not uh, to see you sitting at home twiddling your thumbs. You got involved with some pretty fantastic projects in in lockdown and uh as you say you're not one to say no to anything which is great for me because i managed to coerce you into uh writing and acting in our little film scooch with people on this platform will have heard about a lot um and going across the screen i think i should have a little ticker where you can download scooch now if you want to see it uh written by this fantastic uh, man here Lee, oh, Lee really? and Julie as Thank well. Thank you very um, much. Which, uh, you, I you know. I chipped in a few ideas. I chipped in a few ideas. It's a wonderful. <laughs> and really, really glad as well that you that you start, had a starring role in it. I mean, as I say, we, I mean, we put it together and filmed it quite quickly. Um, and as I, say, I still don't know how that happened. <laughs> I, still, I still don't know. I mean, I'm, I mean, I was just approached, you know, can you chip in a few ideas for the script? And next thing I know, I'm, I'm sitting in a pub throwing crisps in the air and, and I'm somehow... <laughs> I'm somehow an actor, darling. I know. Which was which was a bit odd. You're a but, wonderful uh, actor. Wonderful it's bizarre. Odd, odd. I don't understand it because Lee says exactly the same thing. So I'm, I don't remember saying I would act in this. I think, I think it's some kind of some kind of deep hypnosis or something that was done with us, and we, we just woke up the next day believing we were actors or something. It's, a, it's very strange. And, very well. <laughs> and he didn't just um, help write the script, and he didn't just. Um, act in a leading role in it he also uh, produced these wonderful title um, graphics yeah absolutely oh yeah yeah, show, yeah. A, show a couple of those now with our um, fantastic um robbers and our granny um and things that that we put in there as well all all steven's work yeah absolutely absolutely amazing and now you've seen the the wonderful the wonderful artwork we think we'd just like to show you a little bit of uh, Stephen in action because Stephen, you did handle those scooters remarkably well. Here you oh, go, yeah. a little clip of Scooch. Enjoy. What the? Control receiving from 444. Two males on electric scooters. Over. I think we will handle. Yes, yes. Looks like they've knocked the scooters somehow because they're going very, very fast. Over. Bloody hell! I think there's some coppers behind us. Oh, bloody hell, they got the cars out now. Click, we're losing down here. Oh, bloody time. hell. Come on. OK, OK, go, 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 go. Trust me. Oh. So that was Steve in action, zooming down uh, High Wycombe High Street and back alleys uh, to, to, to get away. Um, but Scooch was not the only lockdown project that you had on the go, was it, Stephen? You created something really rather 
wonderful and I want to talk to you about that a community project that you kicked off that became known as the Monster Zoo. Tell us tell us about how that got started and, and how quickly it grew because it was really quite phenomenal. It was yeah I mean I, it was it was a number of things really I, I mean I'm I'm never one to sort of miss an opportunity if it arises and the one thing that uh, happened when lockdown started is a, lo a lot of people were sort of moaning about oh god I can't do this I can't do that and there was a meme going around at the time, you probably remember, it says at the end of lockdown, you're going to be a, a monk, a drunk, a skunk, uh, a hunk, or a, I can't remember what else it was. But if, but everything seemed to be very negative. You know, it's, it's at the end of lockdown, this is going to happen. And I thought, this is, a, this is a good opportunity to actually take stock of what's going on in your life and actually try and, you know, it isn't very often you get a, a moment in your life where, where your life's put on hold a little bit and you've got time to sort of look at it and think, what can I improve? So I, I did a number of things. I mean, I, 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 I sorted out my health. Um, I was diabetic. I was very overweight. I lost four stone. I'm now pre-diabetic, uh, you know, another stone or so, and I'm going to be in remission. Uh, I sorted out, I mean, my mental health's never been a terrible issue, but I was angry and moaning a lot of the time. I sorted that out by sort of renegotiating my relationship with social media and various things like that. Um, but another thing was I realised that I didn't really... I wasn't really connecting with the community around me because I've been working in London for years. I've been a commuter. I've been getting up early in the morning, getting on a train, rattling into London, doing my job, rattling home again at the end of the day, and then just sitting down, eating my dinner and watching telly. And I hadn't really connected with where I lived. Now that wasn't happening anymore. There was a golden opportunity. And it just so happened around that time, um, the parents were doing a lot of homeschooling. People were working from home. And as I was getting to know some of my neighbours, you know, socially distanced, obviously, as I was getting to know quite a few of my neighbours I'd not met before, I was hearing a lot of moaning and complaints and just general upset, if anything, if, it, if I can use that word, about the fact there was, there was nothing for children to do. And the parents wanted to get their kids out into the fresh air and let's go for a walk, that's boring. And, uh, you know, they wanted them off their screens because obviously there's issues there as well. And I thought it should be possible to do something cheaply, if not free, for local kids. So what I did was I looked around the house, found a lot of old junk, you know, stuff that was in the recycle bin, bits of old pieces I had in the garage, bits of old lawnmowers and things. And I made a series of sculptures of monsters. And what I did was I hid them around some local land. It's quite near here. We've got some woods and meadows where people go and walk their dogs and kids take their families out for a walk or kids go cycling or, you know, and um, so I hid them and I didn't announce it. I didn't do anything more than that. And soon, soon, of course, they started local social media, local Facebook groups. So people start saying, I've just seen this monster in a tree. And then someone will say, Oh, I've seen this one. I wonder how many there are. And I knew this would work, you see, because kids love to find things and kids are also obsessive about being about completing sets as you'll know if you've ever had to do a panini football album or a, or you know collect all the pogs and and of course pokemon go is a really big thing as well so you know i then sort of got a friend of a friend <laughs> to say well i think there's six of them out there um see if you can find them all and suddenly parent kids were dragging their parents off the sofa to go monster hunting which was brilliant and at this point i asked another friend of mine uh, a local photographer called Chris Rowan, I asked him to put up a thing on the Facebook group saying, hey, kids, perhaps you should make some monsters and hide them in the woods as well. Now, we thought we'd get a handful, but my six monsters became 101 monsters within a fortnight. Wow. And kids were just making these things. Now, the, the reason I chose monsters in the first place, because I'd always hoped kids would get involved in this. Um, the reason I chose monsters is because they appeal equally to, you know, boys or girls they um no one can tell them that they're also very inclusive because no one can tell a child that their monster's wrong because there's nothing to compare it to because there are no real monsters as we all know um and uh, and the other thing is i made my ones deliberately out of junk because i know a lot of families either don't have or can't afford art materials so it was kind of nudging them towards the idea that they can make stuff with junk around their houses so, yeah, we got 101 monsters very quickly. And then a message came through on social media saying, anyone know who's behind this project? Because we're going to have to move the monsters. The problem we had was that um, at the time, you probably remember during lockdown, we weren't supposed to be making unnecessary journeys. 
and we we were hearing of people coming from other towns to come and see these monsters and you know to bring their monsters along and put them in the in the collection and also things were getting a little bit crowded in some of the little wooded areas and there was some issues about social distancing so i put my hands up and said yes it was me and the people who managed the land said we can't have this here i'm so sorry because they loved it and they were very apologetic but then um some local farmers who were just a stone's throw away from where these monsters were um called andy and mel they they contacted me and said well we've got space on the farm if you don't mind you know an extra five minutes walk so i went over there and they had a lovely space i mean a really big open space where you could happily fit a hundred people in there and they'd still be able to socially distance so what we did is we set it all up in that new space we um some really brilliant boards were done saying monster zoo and um and kids started bringing in their monsters and people started using it as a community resource they started coming in at weekends and um you know young parents who were dropping their kids off at school and had toddlers would then meet up there with a flask of coffee and and chat and the monster count kept growing and growing and growing uh it got so busy at the weekends although as i say we were still able to socially distance the space was so big and it was in the open air it got so big at the weekends so that we eventually put on a tuck shop and a coffee shop a little coffee shop in there out of one of those um vans that you know he sold coffee out of in the high street and um and it was great for the farm as well because they were able to sell a lot more of their farm produce than they'd ever been able to sell before and uh very soon the monsters reached the heady heights we were heading we we're getting very close to 400 wow. monsters there and and the monsters were, were glorious i mean the kids were so inventive they were so brilliant yeah. and then we caught the attention of grayson perry yes because um at the time he was running it was the second series of grayson's art club on channel four and uh, the people at swan films who make the show contacted me and said we'd like to feature it on the on the show so um yes yeah, so i had a little chat with grayson and uh he had a look around the zoo and he absolutely loved it he really really loved what we were doing there and the result of that is that everyone who got featured on the show during series two then was allowed to exhibit their artwork at bristol museum and art gallery so if you go to bristol museum and art gallery now you'll see one of the original monsters i made plus a rolling slideshow projected onto the wall of every monster made by every single child so it yeah. means that all those kids can say they've had artwork in a, in a, a major UK gallery. It's it's a, it's just, it was just a wonderful thing to be involved in. It was it great. It really was. I mean, I went to the Monster Zoo at the, at the farm. We, you took me around. Uh, oh, of course you did. You met, you met some of the pigs and the chickens yeah. and things, didn't you? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, was, it was lovely. And um, it was just such a beautiful... Is it still story. there? Is the Monster Zoo still there? No, it's not there now. Because naturally, once we came out of lockdown, it kind of wasn't needed anymore. And the number of monsters kept went down to zero and also you know we'd had uh quite a well it wasn't it wasn't a bad weather a winter it wasn't a severe winter but there was snow and a bit of rain and, and you know kids don't always make these monsters out of the best materials it's cardboard and and it all started falling apart a little bit and they weren't coming over and mending them like they would have done before so it kind of reached a natural end really but as i said it is commemorated in the fact it's down in bristol until i think november this year uh, it's being displayed and and the book that came out to accompany the second series of Grayson's Art Club has got a little four page article in the Monster Zoo as well. So oh, it's just it's commemorated. Yeah, it, it's fabulous. It was it was just such a lovely project and it was just beautiful. It but was needed at that time. Yeah, it was needed. Do you have any monsters with you? Here? Yes. Or have no, no, I, I don't have any. Well, I think there's one little one. Hang on. I think there's one little if I can find him. Yeah, this is this is the only one I've got left because the rest are either. Yeah, this is the, this is the little monster that said. This is the little one that said, "Now wash your hands." <laughs> <laughs> as they as they came onto the site, and he's um, um it, it's basically. I mean, this is a, a bleach spray bottle from the kitchen, and this is and the body's a hand sanitizer bottle, and these are the nozzles from the hand sanitizer, and it's all junk. It's all made from junk. Couple of ping pong balls. But you've I also started another interesting art project now, making sculptures out of rubbish. Tell us about that one. Yeah, well, I've always I've always enjoyed um, what they call scratch building or trash building or trash bashing. This idea of of making something from nothing, and um, I started making a few sculptures out of, of out, out of junk. You know, that weren't monsters, just trying something different. I mean, some of the first ones I did 
were things like this little owl made out of an old dead mobile phone case for example and um and it, it started progressing from there to the, to the extent that i've then got hang on <laughs> it kind of got bigger and bigger i mean this is a whale i love that <laughs> This it's is a whale. Amazing. It's most it's mostly made out of um, old mobile phone cases, you know, for, for obsolete dead mobile phones. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Page, who um, helps to run the local food hub. Uh, it's not a food bank. The food hub is a brilliant initiative um, in High Wycombe, nearby High Wycombe, where uh, volunteers go around to all the supermarkets and restaurants and, and food outlets in the town at the end of the day. And they collect up all the residual food, the stuff that would have gone to waste or gone into a skip. They bring it all back, put it into the food hub, which is a shop unit in the town centre. And anyone can shop in there. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or if you haven't got two pennies to rub to your name. You can go in there and you can fill up a handbasket for three quid. It's brilliant because it, it's not only does it give a little bit of dignity back to people who are on lower incomes. So they're not having to ask for handouts and things like that. Because you can fit a lot in a handbasket for three quid. Um, it's all really good food. I mean, this is coming from every supermarket, you know, even, even Waitrose and Marks and Spencers and places like this um it's a really good thing and it's stopping i think it's something ridiculous like 50 tons of food going to waste every month it's amazing yeah but mark food. mark who works there uh, he knows i've got an interest in um you know sort of saving the planet and recycling and, and he knows i make stuff out of junk and he put me on to someone it was basically a new shop unit had opened up and at the back of the shop unit they found stock left behind by the previous owners which was basically a huge pile of mobile phone cases for, for phones that are now obsolete, things like, you know, Blackberries and things like that. So he just gave me this massive sack of mobile phone pieces. And like I said, it ends up making whales. You can see all the keyboards on the back, though, if you look. Yeah. You see, you see it's nearly all made of phones. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I've, I've got some now in a gallery. Uh, there's a gallery in Cornwall in Falmouth, the Waterside Gallery in Falmouth. Which is actually selling seahorses and whales and owls and things that I've made. The owl and the pussycat. I like your owl and the pussycat. Both oh yes, the owl and the pussycat got bought by a, a very nice solicitor just recently. Yeah, <laughs> she's got yeah, that. She's got that on her sideboard. Oh, where was it? Somewhere up in Lancashire, I think, or maybe it was Derbyshire. I'm trying to remember now. These things all blur into each other. But they did. They did their own sort of monster trail as well, junk monster thing, as an alternative to what they usually did every year, which was scarecrows. Yeah, you see, scarecrows are great. Painted pebbles are great. Fairy doors that you put on trees are great, but they all require a degree of artistic ability and materials. Whereas monsters, anyone can do it. Yeah, I love especially it. if you're using junk. So it's yeah, it's lovely. It's nice to know it's it's spreading and carrying on. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, good for you. And you're selling your um, cell phone sculptures online now, aren't you? Yeah, I've I've got, I've got a blog. Um, called the eccentric upcyclist which is a nice complicated name isn't it but um yeah there's a few on sale through there and uh and like i said there's a gallery in cornwall that's now selling them as well so yeah and the details nice. and website details are going across the bottom of the screen now so and as as is all of stephen's uh, social media contacts so do follow him uh, if you have found this interest which i'm sure you will have um and they'll also be in the show notes as well we're now coming up to the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the time for a drink <laughs> we're now we're now coming up to the we're now coming up to the end of our show so stephen we would like to pick your 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 creative brains uh, for somebody who has changed direction. If um, there's anybody out there who who is a bit of a frustrated creative and who is thinking of perhaps changing direction into a more creative career, what would your top three tips be for for maybe making the change or just just going and and doing what your heart desires? Um, top three, top three. I mean, the first obvious one is just do it just just create stuff because you know the more you exercise your creativity the stronger it gets it's like a muscle the more you do it the better you get at it the more the more um adventurous you get the more you explore things i mean you know five years ago i wasn't making things out of junk now i'm making stuff that sells in galleries it's you know just try it have a go and and don't be worried about comparisons don't be worried about what will people think of it to hell with them you know i mean even before we were even vaguely human you go back 
I think the oldest piece of art that's ever been discovered, which we can say was definitely a form of art, is 70,000 years ago, where it was, you know, geometric scratches into rocks. And, and the earliest known proper depiction painting on a wall is, is from about 45, 50,000 years ago, which is a, a picture of a pig. Now, I mean, these people weren't painting it because they thought, I'm going to get in a gallery. They weren't painting it because yeah. they thought, I'm going to make a career out of this. They were doing it just as an expression of who they were. And everyone should do that. Just do what you love doing. And, and the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. It's like it's like any other skill. You know, you wouldn't expect to be able to sit a piano and be able to play, you know, Toccata and Fugue by Bach straight away. It's going to take practice and time and application and learning a few skills. Art, creativity in whatever form it takes, whether it's icing cakes or doing sculptures out of phones, it, you know, put the hours in. You know, yeah. if you want to do it, do it. That's my yeah. first piece of advice. Far too often when I do when I used to do literary festivals and things like this, I'd have people come up saying, oh, I think I might write a book one day. And I'd always think to myself, well, you won't, because if you wanted to write a book, you'd have done it. You'd have, you'd have sat down at the computer and started writing because writers write because they're driven to write, you know, because they want to do it and they, they get better and better as they do it. Yeah. So that's probably my first bit. Just get on with it, you know, yeah. have a go and don't be afraid to try things, try new things. Um, second. I suppose this is a, it's a bit, I, I think it's, it's believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing because you are your own USP. You are your own unique selling point. You know, I, I hear people all the time saying, Oh, I can't draw. I can't paint. And I said, well, how do you know? Have you tried? Yeah. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> have you tried? And they go, yeah, but I tried, but I'm rubbish. And I'm saying, well, how do you know you're rubbish? Well, and invariably it's, oh, well, I, I like this artist and I can't draw like them. Or I know this person, I can't draw like them. Well, tough, they can't draw like you either. You know, you know, it's, you know, when, when Picasso was doing some of his early Cubist work, he had nothing to compare it to. He wasn't, and, and you know, when Picasso was in primary school, he was no better at art than you are now. <laughs> you know, the only thing is he carried on. He believed in himself. He was willing to experiment and he he became his own unique selling point you know mm -hmm. every single person on this planet if if they were all asked to paint a particular thing none of them would produce a thing that's identical you know and and the other thing is of course you can't compare unlike with unlike you can't say that's bad art that's good art i mean i, I used to do things with students where i'd, I'd take them into cause i used to do a few youth projects when i was in the police and I take a group of kids to the National Gallery and I give them a piece of paper with numbers one to five written on it. And I'd say, right, go in there and find the five best pieces of art. And they'd all come out with different lists. Have confidence in yourself. Have a go. There's hope for me yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think the and I think the third the third thing is, and I'm sort of nicking this from uh, the writer Dan Pink. Dan Pink um, wrote a really good book all about work and motivation for work a few years ago. And he said that there's three things you need in order to be happy at work, to be, you know, to be content. Um, and they are autonomy, mastery and purpose. Autonomy is having some degree of control over your life and what you do. Mastery is being given the freedom to become the best you can at what you do. Because, you know, that's a natural human instinct. When we pick up a guitar for the first time, we're not doing it because we think we're going to be headlining the Pyramid Stage at Glastonbury. We're doing it because we want to learn that skill and get better at it. The same as people who go out on the golf links. You know, most of them aren't going out there thinking one day I'm going to play Tiger Woods. They're going out there thinking, I just want to get better at playing golf. People want to become masters of things. So giving people the freedom to do that is a good thing. And the third thing is purpose. You know, it, it's knowing that what you're doing is being done for the right reasons. There's an awful lot of people. There's a, a great writer, sadly died during the pandemic last year, called David Graeber who wrote a number of books on what he called bullshit jobs. Can we swear on this podcast? If yeah. not, you'll have to bleep me. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, he talked a lot about bullshit jobs. He said, it's, it's frightening. The surveys have been done through YouGov and also in other countries <laughs> that show that there's about, there's about 30 people, 30% 30 of people out there are doing jobs they don't think are necessary. <laughs> that, that, that they, you know, there's a lot of people who are doing sort of consultancy work and various jobs like that that really if you if they were removed from the population tomorrow would make no difference whatsoever no. and if, if that's the case if you don't feel you've got a sense of purpose that what you're doing is worth doing you're going to be miserable so find something you love doing that's why that's my, that's my last piece of advice find yeah. something you love doing where you're given the freedom to do it and um and you're given the opportunity to get as good as it at it as you can even if you're just doing it as a hobby 
even if you're just doing it as something to the side of what you do for a living because if you get really really good at it really really good at it you may one day be able to make that your job it's kind of what's happened to me you know it's and there's nothing special about me at all it's um you know despite any superlatives thrown in my direction there really isn't it's just that i'm willing to have a go and it's like i said before you know i i i like to say yes to things and i've always believed that the more you give out the more that comes back you know yeah. i'm always willing to help people when you approach me about scooch i thought i could have easily said oh no i can't be bothered i'm not getting paid for it you know it's hassle I no, it. have a go. Fun. So, so so tremendously delighted that it's done as well as it has because i just yeah, and i've met like, a whole hey, bunch of new this? people and, I've met a whole said, bunch yeah. of new people and that and that bunch of new people have got some extraordinary skills and personalities and amongst that you know i mean the best story i can end with just to say why it's worth doing things a few years ago i was asked to go and speak at a festival i wasn't being paid they covered my transport costs and that was about it and i stood up in this tent with about 30 people listening because there were more important people and famous people in other tents but at the end of the talk, one of the audience, who was a, a Dutch lady, came up and said, that was really interesting. I work for an insurance company called Aegis, and um, we've just had our annual conference in Dublin. I think you'd be a great speaker for next year. W would you be up for that sort of thing? And I said, yeah, yeah, that would be fine. Here's my business card. Thought no more of it until about seven months later when I got a phone call from someone at Aegis saying, can you come into our London office? Uh, we'd like to speak to you about, yeah, you said you might be up for a, being a speaker at this at this year's conference and i said yeah lovely so i trolled into london again on my own money you know got on the train went to london uh, i said yes and i sat in the office and i said so yes and i said yeah we'd love you to be a speaker at our conference this year and i said oh it's great i really like dublin he said oh no dublin was last year it's kuala lumpur this year i went okay <laughs> and you know it was it's, it's like a huge ages it's a huge multinational insurance con con yeah. conglomerate they flew me out the business class they put me up in a five-star hotel where i had my own butler mm -hmm. they took me on a tour around the island's most famous beauty spots they took me for a meal at the patronus towers where i sat on the table next to the king they also paid me a very decent fee and all i do is stand on stage and do the same speech i've done for free at that festival like a 45 minute speech but it wouldn't have happened if i hadn't said yes if yeah. I hadn't said, yeah, why not? Have a go. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the strongest message I can give to anyone. Don't let opportunities slip away. Take yeah. them. I totally you never know where they're going to lead. Never know where they're going to lead. Totally, totally agree, agree with that. And I think that's a fabulous piece of advice to end on. But before we go, we are going to play our lovely values jam game. Ooh, so, okay. And I love these cards. They're so every time this is my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the show because they're so tactile, Steve. I mean, you have to come round, you have to feel my cards. Okay. They're, 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 they're so gorgeous. Day. They're silky. Oh, they're lovely. Okay, so I'm going to touch my cards. So yes, this is my favorite, one of my favorite bits. So I've shuffled the cards and I'm just going to spread them out and I'm just going to run my finger along them. And if you say stop, I will pull a card and we'll talk about whatever's on that card. Okay, stop. All right, what have we got in the middle here? I don't know. Oh, we're going to talk about balance. 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 Well, I don't have very much. <laughs> I kept Great falling off motor about balance. <laughs> yeah, I fell off motorbikes a lot when I was younger. So my, my dad got me driving a car as soon as possible because as he put it, you can't fall off a car. So um, <laughs> yeah, true enough. Okay. So my first question about balance is what does balance what does balance mean to you personally? What does it look, feel, and sound like? For me, balance is, um, I've done a fair bit of life coaching in my time, and I trained as a life coach, which always sounds a bit fluffy and, and wishy-washy, but it's actually really, really interesting because it, it just helps people get their, get their sort of priorities lined up, helps them get their ducks in order, as it were, you know, in a row. And um, for me, balance is all about... If you can imagine all different aspects of your life, you know, such as, you know, your mental health, your physical health, um, your, your family, your relationships, your, you know, your work. It's, it's like throwing lots of balls up in the air and juggling at once. And you, you, you start to realize that they're all a little bit fragile. And if you keep dropping them, they're going to smash. And the only one that ever bounces back and never gets hurt is work. So it's, it's a case of, you know, balance for me is, is if all of those 
balls are kept in the air and they're all equal uh, and everything works. So it's really, really important that work doesn't take over your life. We, we, in this country, we, we celebrate the wrong things. We celebrate burnout. We celebrate people, you know, we celebrate people who work too hard. You know, we say, oh, he's really brilliant. He, go, he goes the extra 110%. Sod that, he's not paid for the other 10%, you know? <laughs> um, we've really got to stop doing this and you've got to concentrate a lot more on the things that really matter. You know, your family, your health, uh, your home, your friends, and, and, and you as a person, you know, the, the things that you think are important. You know, it's like Marie Kondo says, if it doesn't bring you joy, get rid of it. If, you know, it, it's the things that matter to me are the things that I, everything else I do is all about giving me the time and the resources to do the things that actually matter. Mm. That's the important thing for me. And I think it's balance for me is, is not letting work and the things I don't want to do and the things that can do me harm take over they did for a long time you know certainly my weight you know because food is one of my pleasures and it took over and you know sport isn't one of my pleasures and I lost it but I've got my weight back under control again now and I've got my mental health under control and having that sense of equilibrium having that sense of balance now means that I'm actually I've been blown by trouble I think I'm one of the happiest people I know it's Aww. very rare you'll ever see me down now, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm lucky that I don't suffer from depression or anything else that's debilitating like that. So in that respect, I'm not doing down anyone who has to deal with those sort of things on a daily basis, because that must be awful. But generally, I am a very happy person. And I think a lot of that is because I've got a decent work-life balance and I've got the time to do the things that I think matter most. Yeah, I think that's that's fantastic because you say there's a saying, isn't there? You know, when you're on your deathbed, nobody ever wishes that they'd spend more time at work. No, I mean, Dan Pinker, Dan Pinker, we just mentioned earlier about when you talk about autonomy, he, I, there was a, a conference a couple of days ago called Nudge Stop, which is the big annual behavioral science conference. And I've, I've been a keynote a couple of times. So I, I was uh, joining in with it, it's online now. I joined in with it this year. And, and Dan Pink's just written a new book on regret uh, and the power of regret and the fact that, yeah, it, it's, you, you can harness regret instead of looking backwards and thinking, oh, I should have gone to the university or I should have done this. And instead of that, think, well, what can I learn from that now that I can take into the future and, and fix? I mean, the example he gave was, he said when he was younger, he was never a bully, but he saw bullying going on and he didn't step in, he didn't do anything about it. And he regrets that, but he's used that now to empower him that now he's very proactive in making sure that the workplace is a kind, safe, supportive place. Uh, and any instance of bullying is stamped on or dealt with properly um, because he can't change the past, but he can make the future. And that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is all we've got time for, I'm afraid. It's been an absolute delight talking to you, Stephen, as always. Yes. And um, we and vice versa. You... And vice versa. Uh, yes, yeah, and you got and it, and it helps being happy having just fabulous friends, clearly, doesn't it, Stephen? Of course it does, <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, it, I, I'm delighted to be able to call you friend and um we wish you every success in whatever you're you you're doing next. And yourselves and good luck with creatives. It's a great initiative. Thank you. Well, that's it from us, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye.